going to go straight to Andy Motoro. Uh, Andy, are you with us? I am. Thank you. And thanks for doing that. Alaska Wilderness League, speak your piece. Yeah, so I'm calling from Anchorage, Alaska today. Um, Beautiful place. Life. Beautiful place, love it, and you know, it's been a very tough year with the Trump administration, um, particularly for the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is 20 million acres in the northeast corner of Alaska. Um, as you would probably know, protected for since 1960. Uh, it's got it all. It's got glaciers, it's got mountains, it's got a coastal plain where 200,000 caribou give birth each year to their uh, young. Um, these caribou sustain the Gwich'in Nation, a um, bunch of villages south of the Brooks Range as they migrate thousands of miles each year. Um, and it is a biological hot spot in Alaska and it's a uh, critical importance um, and Scott Pruitt is going to save it and therefore you're thrilled <laughs> yeah yeah no I wish no instead oh. what happened last year um, as we all know tax reform flew through um, and our, U our US Senator Lisa Murkowski managed to cheat the system and she got a rider into it and it opened up the 1.5 million acre coastal plain, the biological heart of the refuge, to oil and gas development. It's the first time a national wildlife refuge has had in its purpose now oil and gas development. It's disgusting, and the Trump administration is continuing to follow this wrong by fast-tracking leasing for oil companies to go up there and look for oil, and that process started last Friday. What's the political power structure, if you want to give us a window into that, in Alaska? My, I've been to Alaska, I, I played basketball, at the in in Sitka, Alaska, uh, as the as the one sort of Howley playing with uh, Aleuts and Clinkets in the in the uh, community center, my experience with Alaska nonetheless is somewhat limited. The uh, my guess is that Murkowski had been making promise after promise after promise year after year after year from doing something that must have been a top priority for industrial wealth in Alaska, uh, in terms of opening up the refuge to drilling. What can you tell us about kind of the political power dynamic in Alaska? Yeah, you know, it's a fa really good question. And, you know, the first words out of Lisa's mouth when Trump won election was, maybe we'll get the Arctic refuge. You could tell she was excited about it. And in recent decades, our economy has de been defined by oil. You know, that's been what's been driving our state government and everything else. But Alaska's always been a place that is defined by the lands and waters. You know, there's a Alaska Native tradition that has, has spans thousands of years up here. And it's really unfortunate that the profit motive of, of Lisa and the corporations that push her to do these things, and many Alaska elected leaders for that matter, Matter, are so short-sighted in their decisions of what to pursue and that's exactly what we're seeing here today with so much with so many of the jobs connected to natural resources in Alaska and with so much of the economic power organized to do more exploitation get more profit out of those uh, out of those resources uh, what do you do on the ground what does your organizing look like what is the environmental advocacy space look like where you are yeah, you know, the only reason to drill the Arctic Refuge is to make a quick dollar. And unfortunately, it mortgages the future for Alaskans that rely on that for sustainable economies, whether it's tourism. You know, across the state of Alaska, there's a variety of other projects that, um, you know, threaten fisheries. And fisheries used to define Alaska's economy, right? On top of that, we're one of the best states in the nation to live in. You know, we have mountains at our back doors. We have uh, adventure anywhere you want to find it. And so we can attract the best and brightest up here. But, you know, that's going to be based not on making a quick buck by mortgaging our future, by destroying our, our critical lands and, and impacting you know, caribou herds that have migrated for thousands of years across this region just to make a buck for a decade, you know, which is literally $750 million over 10 years is what the CBO scored this uh, push to open the refuge. So you know, our work up here is harnessing those voices, elevating them. Uh, we stand very firmly with the Gwich'in Nation, who has been long been opposed to oil and gas development because they're worried this will change their traditions and livelihoods. Yeah, it seemed like the and first people, it seemed like the native tribes would be an important piece of the of the sort of advocacy apparatus. You got a chance, what are you hoping as we uh, wrap this segment in, a, in a, about 30 seconds, uh, what are you hoping yeah. for now or what do you think might be possible now? You know, we got a lot of work ahead of us, but I'm confident that the bipartisan history of support for protecting this place will be protected. Um, you know, vis visit alaskawild.org. You can submit a comment to the Trump administration, help us build the record that says the o Arctic Refuge is not for oil and gas development. It's going to be a long road in front of us, but we're here to fight it, and we've not given up yet. Well, I want to say thanks for calling in. Thanks for your advocacy. It is in, in the first hour with the conversation about climate change. Uh, in the discussion yesterday about what are some of the big lies that we are uh, facing as a country, the idea of where, wither the collective interest, wither the public good. And thanks for working on that public good, and thanks for calling in. Hey, thank you. Really before you hang it. up, before you hang up, hope or no hope yeah. on climate change? 
Oh, that's a whole other segment. I uh, hope. <laughs> All right. Well, I just wanted one word. Thanks, Andy. Thanks yeah. for joining us. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yep.